suppose okay given given a smooth closed initial hypersurface F0 Mn in a smooth Riemannian manifold as before, <coughs> then there is a maximum time interval zero T max where T max is certainly positive and may or may not be infinite <coughs> where a smooth solution exists. And if T max happens to be finite, then we can detect this by seeing that the curvature blows up. Then the soup of the second fundamental form on MNT is unbounded as T tends to T max. So this is the smoothing property that uh, Toti Descalopoulos already mentioned. Uh, so it can, and it's a parabolic property of this equation. It cannot happen that the first 27 derivatives of the curvature remain bounded and the 28th derivative blows up. This cannot happen. If the curvature is bounded, then all the higher derivatives are bounded and the surface remains smooth, and then we can extend the flow further. So, sketch of proof. Yes? Both is possible. No, but that's a different uh, proof. So you can prove that something that is embedded remains embedded, okay? Um, but for this existence proof, uh, the surfaces can be immersed. And as part of the proof, I show that an immersion stays an immersion, okay? The sketch of the proof. So the key thing here is uh, <clears throat> to assume that the curvature is bounded and then show that you can extend the solution beyond T max. So suppose the soup of A squared, M and T is less than some C0 squared, less than, or call it D0 squared, less than infinity <coughs> for all T uh, less than T max. And then we want to, buy a, to bound the higher derivatives. So <coughs> we need the evolution equation of the higher derivatives. So compute from the evolution equation of the second fundamental form. Remember, this was <coughs> Laplacian of HIJ minus 2H HIL, HLJ plus a squared hij, and yeah, I only do this in Rn plus one because in a fixed Riemannian ambient manifold, the extra terms are lower order anyway, right? So it's enough to understand how this works in Riemannian space. <coughs> and it would be too complicated to do everything um, <coughs> uh, step for all the indices. So in order to get a reasonable notation, we write this in the following way. We write this as Laplacian of second fundamental form. And these terms here, <coughs> we just combine and say these are linear combinations of the second fundamental form with itself. 
right? <coughs> in fact, these are cubic terms. So this notation here means linear combinations of cubic terms in A, possibly with contractions with the metric. If we use this notation, then you see that DDT of the gradient of the second fundamental form can be written as a term involving the gradient of DDT of A and from the covariant derivative there will be some DDT of uh, Christoffel symbols. So we need to know what is DDT of the Christoffel symbols. But the Christoffel symbols are of the form, uh, as you know, GIJ, G upper I, J, and then there here is derivatives, DDX I of, of G. So since DDT of G, this was a minus 2H HIJ, so this can be written as A star A. The derivative of Christoffel symbols has certainly the form, uh, <coughs> here's, this is just metric, so we just have to worry about this. Differentiating this gives one derivative of A times A, so we can write this as gradient A star A. So this gives us that DDT of gradient A can be written as the gradient of um, Laplace A plus A star A star A plus gradient A uh, star A star A. So the whole thing is equal to and now if I, <clears throat> so I certainly get here something which is Laplacian of gradient A. I switch these derivatives. This gives me an extra term which looks like gradient A star A star A. But all the other terms are the same, right? If I took gradient here or gradient there, I always get one gradient and two terms which are not gradient. So, and this is all I need. I need to know just the order of these terms because then if I compute what is DDT of gradient A squared, what I'm really interested in, uh, I just multiply this with gradient A, uh, <coughs> then I get uh, two times um, gradient A uh, <coughs> times um, uh, Laplace uh, gradient A uh, plus uh, gradient A star gradient A star A star A. And this one here, this can be written <coughs> as um, Laplacian of gradient A squared minus, you see, if I do the Laplacian, I get this term, but I also get this so-called Bochner term, where I have the square of the second derivatives. I think it's very useful to know this notation because it allows you <coughs> without worrying about individual indices to get the structures of the equation straight. It was invented by Richard Hamilton. So this now means, if I apply Schwarz inequality there, that I get an inequality. DDT of the gradient of the curvature can be estimated by the Laplacian of the gradient of the curvature minus two times this Bochner term plus, and this one I just estimate this is a linear combination, so there's some constant depending on, <coughs> call it C1, depending just on the dimension times gradient A squared times A squared. 
Okay. So we know the structure of the evolution of the first derivative. And then you just do induction. And you compute that ddt of any higher derivatives of A <coughs> can be estimated by Laplacian of these higher derivatives. And you get also the Bochner term with the next highest derivative. And then you get a whole bunch of these terms, and you can write them the sum i plus j plus k equals m. You always get one term, and here's constants, cn of n. You always get one term because you have a square here, which is like the gradient m. And then you get lower derivatives. You get gradient ia, you get gradient ja, and you get gradient ka. You always get four terms, just like here. And the sum of all the derivatives you get has to be of order m. So you can have this, in this way, you can have the structure of the evolution of all the higher derivatives under control. And, and now we're going to bound these higher derivatives under the assumption that our curvature is bounded. You see, if the curvature is not bounded, then this term here is a disaster. But if this is bounded, this is just linear in the gradient of A. So our chance is to estimate this term because this is bounded. Now, if you uh, <coughs> do it brutally, this would already be enough. This would sort of give you, if this is bounded, gives you sort of exponential growth of gradient A. But I want to show you a trick that's important that lets you avoid this dependence on time altogether. So <coughs> recall that we had um, DDTA equals Laplace A plus A star A. So this means in particular that DDT of A squared <coughs> is equal to Laplacian of A squared minus 2 gradient A squared uh, plus 2A uh, to the 4. Of course, if you put um, M equals 0, it conforms with this uh, formula here. But you see, if we do, now suppose we want to estimate the gradient of A, and this term is bounded times gradient A squared, then we can swallow this term if we add enough of that term. Okay? That's an important trick. So <coughs> consider the function F equals gradient A squared, which we want to bound, and then add enough alpha 1 times A squared uh, in order to overcome this. And let's see how this works out. Then we get DDT of F. We get the Laplacian everywhere, so we get less than the Laplacian of F. I throw this one away. I don't need it right now. But, OK, let's write it down. Just I, I'm not going to use it. I only need it in the next step when I go for the second derivatives, because then that's going to make me my good term. So let's not throw it away, but I don't need it for the bound of f. And then estimate this guy here by c1 of n times d0 squared by our assumption times gradient a squared, and then I get from here minus, um, uh, <coughs> minus 2 alpha 1 uh, gradient a squared. And I pay for this uh, with this term. Um, <coughs> so I get plus uh, 2 alpha 1 a <coughs> Um, a to the 4, but a to the 4 I can estimate by d0 to the 4 because it's bounded. OK? 
okay? And now you can see, if you choose alpha 1, something like, <clears throat> what did I take? Um, choose uh, alpha 1 equal to, right, okay, so, <clears throat> so if you choose, so uh, choose alpha 1 equals um, um, maybe, maybe twice this guy, 2c1 uh, times d0 squared. And consider the first instance, so some point p naught and some time uh, <coughs> t naught, where f reaches a new maximum, say k, some big number, then at this point, then at that instance, we must have, because it's a new, because it's a new maximum, so we must have ddt of f at this point, p naught, t naught, must be greater or equal to zero because it's a new maximum. On the other hand, because in space it's a maximum, we must have Laplace of f at p naught, t naught, less or equal to zero. So if this <coughs> is true, then at p naught, t naught, we get that zero is less than zero minus zero. And then here, if I put alpha one, as I said there, I get um, minus uh, 3c1 times d0 squared times gradient a squared. And I get a bad term plus uh, 2 alpha 1 times d0 to the 4. But <coughs> so I put this on the other side, so I get 3c1 d0 squared times gradient a squared, but, it, but gradient a squared is equal to f um, minus alpha 1, and alpha 1 I have chosen um, to be uh, c1 d0 squared. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm too fast. f minus alpha 1 a squared less than 2 alpha 1 d0 to the 4, right, I get this. But the f at this point is equal to k, so I get 3 c1 d0 squared times k minus, and this one I can bound from above by um, d0 squared times alpha 1, which is uh, 2 c1 d0 squared. And you see this is a contradiction, contradiction if k is bigger than something like some multiple, multiple of d0 to the 4, a constant on n and c1 times d0 to the 4. Right? If this is too big, this is a contradiction. So this means we can never achieve a maximum bigger than d0 to the 4. So this concludes that, uh, <coughs> that the f, that since, uh, since the dA squared is less than the f, we get that the sup of dA squared on m and t is less than this constant uh, times d0 to the 4. And this is also the correct scale. And this is for all the t's in 0 to t max. Okay. So this way you get out of the curvature estimate 
a gradient in the estimate which is independent of time. You, you don't have this exponential growth because you have this good term on the right hand side that you get from the term of lower order. And now you iterate this procedure. procedure. So in the same sense with induction, you get that the soup of gradient m a squared over mn t is less than some constant times d0 to the, <coughs> to the uh, <coughs> 2 plus 2m. So we get all the higher derivatives uh, bounded. Now, on the other hand, we need to know that it remains in immersion. This question came up already. So we need one more step to show, in order to show that things converge to a nice limit as t approaches t max, so that we can use our short time existence result. We need to show that the thing remains uh, immersion. And there is a, a nice lemma, I guess it was known before, but Richard Hamilton wrote it down. And it is purely on matrices. So if <coughs> a <coughs> positive definite time dependent matrix Gij of T, so you think of the metric here, uh, satisfies that the integral from zero to capital T of DDT of Gij dt, yeah, here of tau d tau, is less than some constant <coughs> L less than infinity, then <coughs> all metrics <coughs> Gij of t are uniformly equivalent equivalent on zero t and uh, Gij of t converges to a positive definite metric as uh, t approaches t. And uh, t could even be uh, uh, infinite. Okay. There's an absolute value missing here. And uh, the proof is simple. Uh, you just take any, uh, <coughs> take any vector, fix x uh, in, say, in our case, it would be in the tangent point, tangent space of the surface, independent of time, and you compute DDT of the logarithm of um, <coughs> the norm of x with respect to the matrix G of t, and then you get uh, 1 on x squared with respect to the metric at time t times uh, two times uh, the derivatives of Gij since x is, uh, no, the derivative of this times xi xj because uh, the x's are independent of t and uh, this can be estimated just by, um, in terms of absolute value, by um, uh, DDT of uh, Gij with respect to the metric at t by Schwarz inequality, and then you just integrate and you get that the logarithm of um, <coughs> the ratio is bounded. I think I can erase this. Yeah. I write it down. 
comes. It's not an assumption. It's a, it's a conclusion. Right? I, I start with something positive, definite, right? Yeah, and now I want a proof. As long as long as this lemma, this integral estimate is true, they remain equivalent. And uh, right, so so with this estimate, you get that the log of uh, <coughs> of uh, x squared with respect to t two divided by the log uh, divided by x squared of uh, with respect to some other time t one is less than the integral from t1 to t2 of um, ddt of gij at tau d tau is less than l. And therefore, you conclude that, and, and you get uh, the absolute value of this. And this tells you that the norm at times uh, t, at any t, is bounded by um, e to the uh, l times um, the norm, say, at uh, time zero. And similarly, that this is bounded below by e to the minus l times the norm at time zero. And this is what I mean by uniformly equivalent for the norm. So this proves the uh, <coughs> uh, this proves the, the, the first thing. And then <coughs> notice that from this it also follows, also x squared t is Cauchy as t approaches capital T, because you have this uh, uh, integral bound on the derivative. And uh, therefore, these guys converge, x squared t converges uh, for all x. And then by polarization, if the uh, squares converge, you also get the inner products. Then by polarization, uh, x, y with respect to gt converges for all x, y. So we get a, and, and this limiting metric, of course, is also uniformly equivalent with the same bound um, that we had for all the x squared of t. And uh, therefore, we get a limit metric um, as t approaches capital T and the surfaces remain immersed. Notice that this is, of course, the key difference uh, to, say, the harmonic map heat flow. And the harmonic map heat flow, which is on the surface, a nicer equation, it's more lim linear. But if you start with, uh, uh, even if your initial map is an immersion, under the harmonic, me harmon harmonic map heat flow, um, you don't have such a theorem. Yeah? It doesn't work. You, you, in fact, it's wrong. There are examples that you start with a hypersurface immersion as a map, and then the harmonic map heat flow just mixes up the map completely, and it uh, doesn't remain um, a hypersurface, or a diffeomorphism does not remain a diffeomorphism. And that's why people moved from the harmonic map heat flow that was pioneered by Jim Eels uh, and, uh, and Sampson uh, towards things like mean curvature flow and Ricci flow, which have these properties. And that they have this property depends on this lemma. OK, so now we can wrap up our proof. Um, At time t, at time t, yeah, with, with them, with them evaluated at the because that's what I need when I do the Schwarz inequality, yeah. So there is a t uh, missing, uh, meaning the dependence of the You want one more t, yeah. No, yeah, thank you. So in our case, So in our case, d 
ddt gij t is of course uh, <coughs> the norm of minus 2h hij squared and this is uh, 4h squared a squared um, and uh, this is uh, <coughs> less than uh, 4 and a to the 4 is uh, less than 4n times d0 to the 4, okay? So, and since, so if t max is less than infinity, then the integral from 0 to t max of d dt of g i j t dt is uh, uh, less than uh, 2 square root of n times d0 squared times uh, t max. Less than infin infinity. So it's important here that we use our hypothesis that t max is less than infinity. And you already see um, where there are possible pitfalls, and I've seen papers that were wrong because of that, where people claim that they, that they have convergence as t tends to infinity, but in reality, their estimate for ddt of gij was just decaying like 1 on t. So you quite often, in terms of the scaling, 1 on t would be just right, okay? But 1 on t is not good enough to give you this, uh, um, to give you the assumptions of the lemma. So to get convergence, say, even in the case t tending to infinity, you have to be extremely careful that you get an estimate which is a little bit better than what you expect from the scaling. Okay, so our lemma applies. Therefore, the surfaces remain in emergence, and, and uh, the speed is now bounded, the mean curvature is bounded because the curvature is bounded. So we get a, so as t tends to t max, we get that uh, mn t converges to mn t max, a smooth, limiting hypersurface immersion. And then you just use on this one short time existence. Use short time existence. And this gives you a solution which is a little bit longer because this new solution, because you have so much smoothness, fits together with the old solution. So you get a solution of mean curvature flow on zero T max plus epsilon. But this is a contradiction because T max was the maximal time where we had a smooth solution. And uh, then we are done. So it cannot be, it cannot be that the curvature is uniformly bounded up to the maximal time, because then we could get a smooth limit surface and use short time existence to go a little bit beyond. The standard procedure for many nonlinear um, geometric evolution equations. Okay, so now we know how to detect singularities. And uh, Carlo yesterday showed you that there are many different singularities <coughs> that we can get. Now to <coughs> understand the singularities better, one needs a rescaling procedure that Carlo <coughs> uh, mentioned already yesterday. And you, we need a more precise control on the smoothing behavior of the hypersurface. So before I come to the monotonicity formula, I want to show you as long as this is on the board, how you can improve the estimates that I just did on the gradient a little bit. <coughs> you see here, the estimate on the gradient was somehow uh, <coughs> assuming that we had initially a gradient bound because I only said a new maximum cannot occur. So. The, uh, it would be nice to have an estimate which only depends 
on the curvature bound uh, and does not assume anything on the initial smoothness of the hypersurface. So <coughs> notice that the gradient estimate, gradient estimate can be improved. And this is a very useful tri trick as well. Namely, we choose a slightly different f. We choose as f, we, we smuggle in a factor t in front of the gradient a squared. And then we put alpha 1 times a squared, yeah. like before. So it didn't change much. I just put the t. But this makes more sense, actually, because the alpha 1 should be really, it should be a constant which does not depend on scaling itself. Remember, we chose alpha 1 comparable to uh, d0 squared in order to get the scaling right. Now the t takes care of two factors of scaling. So I could choose the alpha 1, something to be independent of uh, scaling. In fact, we could choose alpha 1 to be 1 or 2 this time. And then <coughs> when you do the computation, you get ddt of f. This time is less than Laplacian of f. I throw away the second derivatives, <coughs> and I get the uh, uh, c1 times uh, d0 squared, and now I get minus uh, 4. Uh, oops, this is not such, hang on, what did I do, uh, c1, um, Maybe, maybe I'm too fast here. So let's put the alpha 1. And I get um, times uh, t times gradient a squared. And I put um, minus alpha. Ah, OK, that was my mistake. Alpha 1, um, I forgot the t. Here's a t. And then I can put the 4, and there's no t here, OK? I forgot the factor t here. We, we, we had four, before, we had c1, d0 squared, but now I have the t. And I, my, minus 2 alpha 1, alpha 1 equals 2. And um, I get one extra term from the differentiating the t, OK? And the other term is the. Uh, 2 alpha 1, which was plus, plus 4 d0 to the 4. So the only damage I've done here is this. But now you see, if the time interval is not too long, <coughs> so if the time interval now, if, if t is in something like 0, uh, c1 to the minus 1, d0 to the minus 2, times, um, yeah, times 1 is enough. If I have this controlled time interval, and notice that the scaling is the inverse of curvature squared, as it should be, then I get a contradiction, get contradiction at new maximum if uh, <coughs> gradient A squared is bigger than a certain constant depending on n divided by t times d0 squared. So in other words, we now get an estimate <coughs> which is completely independent of the initial data of the gradient of a. Just on, depends on the curvature bound. This is called an interior in time gradient estimate. So theorem, suppose on <coughs> MNT, 
solution of mean curvature flow as above. So closed manifold, smooth ambient space, no boundary. Uh, we have the soup of <coughs> A squared, MNT, is uniformly bounded. Then <coughs> there is a time interval, delta 1 greater than 0, such that on the time interval 0, delta 1, d0 squared to the minus 2, we have that the soup of the gradient <coughs> mnt is less than a constant uh, c1 just depending on n uh, divided by t times d0 squared. And then by induction, you get that the soup over uh, gradient m, a squared over mnt is less than a constant c m of n over t to the m times d0 squared on some time interval uh, from 0 to some delta depending on m times d0 to the minus 2. And this is a, what I call an interior in time a <coughs> derivative estimate. And they are particularly nice because they scale right in terms of time and uh, uh, the, the, the cor it's exactly the correct power in terms of uh, curvature and the time uh, involved. Now, this was rather easy. So you see, just sort of maximum principle type argument. Uh, you can do this also in space, right? So instead of doing an interior estimate in time, by the way, this could start at any time, right? You don't have to start this at time zero. You could also start this at some time t naught. Uh, <coughs> but uh, if you want to do it interior in space, then you have to use a cutoff function. And that is just a little bit too messy to present it in this class because it would just take too much time to write it all on the board. So let me just state uh, the result as a remark. Can also prove <coughs> uh, interior in space and time estimates. For example, if um, the soup of A squared over MNT intersected with some large ball, two B, B, 2R around some point x naught is bounded by d naught squared on <coughs> some interval 0 uh, t, then you can get the soup of the gradient <coughs> or even higher derivatives of the gradient over the surface on uh, the smaller ball of just radius r around x naught bounded by constant depending on n and m divided uh, yeah, times uh, 1 over t plus 1 over r squared to the power m times d naught squared. So very similar, but now you, the penalty you have to pay compared to this estimate is, of course, that instead of just having a bad term like 1 on t, you also have to get a bad term 1 on r squared if the uh, region that you're considering is small. Okay. And uh, this would uh, be done with a cutoff function 
and the cutoff function people use, uh, for example, eta of x is uh, something like x minus x naught squared minus uh, 2r squared squared, and the positive part of that. So you, you sort of use a cutoff function that picks out this point. And here's r, or 2r. And uh, this is, for example, in the paper um, uh, with Klaus Ecker a long time ago uh, in Inventiones. <clears throat> yes, or in the book of Klaus Ecker. Yes. Sorry? Well, you have to make the hypothesis that the curvature is bounded on a bigger region in order to deal with the cutoff function, all right? And you get the result then only on a smaller region. Yeah? Now, that I use two and one is arbitrary. I could also take here, I could have taken, instead of uh, two, I could have taken 11 over 10, but that, then this constant gets worse. You need, you need a little bit of room to squeeze in the cutoff function. And you, you need the, you only get the uh, good estimate where the cutoff function is reasonably big, right? But you need the curvature bound on the whole region where the cutoff function lives. And that's why you have to give up a little bit of space. Okay. So now we essentially, you know, this is a lot, this is a big part of the regularity theory for um, mean curvature flow because it's very general and you can, and, and it's completely scaling invariant. So this, this, this uh, estimates here survive. If you rescale the thing, they, they survive because uh, left hand right side and right hand side are ex scaling exactly right. So it's sort of the best that you can hope for. Um, for example, <coughs> in the theory of nonlinear hyperbolic equations, like Einstein's equations, you don't have such estimates, and that makes them so hard. Yes? Yes. You, because um, you get, of course, then the constants will all, these constants here will depend on the curvature of this Riemannian manifold, or this constant here, right? But they are lower order terms because it's a smooth, smooth thing that doesn't move, yeah. Okay, so the next tool I want to show you is the monotonicity formula. And the idea of the monotonicity formula is to say, okay, mean curvature flow is DDTF equals Laplace Beltrami of F. Well, it was a funny Laplace Beltrami, but if you linearize it, it's the usual Laplacian. If you linearize it around the tangent space of the manifold, it's the usual Laplacian on the tangent space. Therefore, couldn't we somehow compare the behavior of a mean curvature flow to the behavior of the ordinary heat equation in the ambient space? So <coughs> consider a positive solution <coughs> U on the ambient space. Well, I could, yeah, let's do, let's do this even, just to show you how general this is on the, <coughs> on the, uh, in the Riemannian setting uh, <coughs> of DDTU equals minus Laplacian bar of U. And Laplacian uh, bar refers to the metric G bar. And if you like, you can think of Rn plus one. Yeah, so Rn plus one, uh, <coughs> um, so this could, this could be Rn plus one and you just have the heat equation. So for example, in 
Rn plus 1. This is sometimes also, this is, this is called the backward heat equation. Or I prefer to call it the adjoint heat equation. And of course, in Rn plus 1, you can just take the heat kernel, the backward heat kernel, K of x and t is 1 over 4 pi uh, t naught minus t to the n plus 1 over 2 times e to the minus x minus x naught squared over 4 times t naught minus t. And this uh, heat kernel has the property, here's x naught, and it's centered at time uh, t zero. So uh, first it looks like the usual Gaussian, and then as time approaches t zero, it looks like the delta function. Uh, <coughs> so this is at time t two bigger than t one, and this is at time t one. And uh, this heat equation, of course, is extremely important. This backward kernel, for example, gives you the uh, representation formula for solutions of the ordinary heat equation, right? If you fold this kernel with some initial data f, it gives you the solution of um, the heat equation at the uh, time uh, t naught at the point x naught. So, Maybe it, if it gives us, if this kernel, say, has all the information of solutions of the ordinary heat equation, maybe we can use this kernel to get information about our mean curvature flow. Now, it turns out the uh, uh, kernel here satisfies um, inter some interesting relations. So just notice that you get that di dj of the logarithm of this kernel k. So if we take the logarithm, we, forget, we can forget the factor just depending on t in front, just to take the Hessian of um, this logarithm here, and we get um, minus uh, delta ij. Um, minus delta ij divided by 2 times t naught minus t. So there's a very um, easy expression for this logarithm. It's concave function. And there's a not hard to prove theorem. Um, I don't know who saw this first. Uh, it's certainly related to Richard Hamilton, but people like Elliot Leap told me about it, and, and, and this was known before. It's simply, if you have an arbitrary u, on Rn plus 1 to R, U positive, and U satisfying the heat equation, the adjoint heat equation. And now in the Rn plus 1 case, then it is true that the IDJ of the logarithm of um, u divided by k is greater or equal to 0. In other words, the logarithm of the quotient of an arbitrary positive solution of the heat equation with the standard kernel is concave. Yeah. It's convex, sorry. Um, okay, so I, I, I rephrase it here, yeah. So that's just a property of linear, of solutions to the linear heat equation. The log of the quotient of um, an arbitrary solution and the, um, all right, so the, Let's write it down here again. So theorem for an arbitrary, we get that 
di dj of log of u divided by k is greater or equal to zero. Where u, where k is the kernel and u arbitrary. Yes, as a quadratic form. Yes. In, in other words, log of u divided by k is convex. Arbitrary solution of ddt u. Now, when you spell this out, when you spell this out, just, just do the computation, what you get is uh, that di dj of u um, minus di u dj u divided by u um, minus uh, u times delta ij over 2 t naught minus t is a non-negative matrix. Again, again, in the sense of quadratic forms. This is what Richard Hamilton calls a matrix Hanak inequality. <clears throat> because, why, why, why Hanak? What does this have to do with Hanak? It's because <coughs> you get as corollary, you get just take the trace, but taking the trace, you get that the Laplacian u minus gradient u squared divided by u plus, oops, here's a plus sign. Got it wrong here. There's a plus sign, sorry. Plus uh, n times u over 2 t naught minus t is uh, greater or equal to zero. And this is, uh, <coughs> um, this gives you a lower bound on DDTU. Um, implies Hanak after integrating Hanak inequality after integrating a DDT of log U along space-time curves. I'm not going to do this, but you know, this gives a lower bound on log u, and if you have a lower bound on log u, it tells you how, how quickly can u cool off at most. And uh, this is the term that tells you how much it can cool off at most, and gives you a very precise estimate. And of course, notice that you have equality on heat kernel. So you have a very, you get a very precise Hanak estimate, and this inequality here is very sharp. And I should also point out that this inequality was <coughs> generalized by uh, Li and Xing Tung Yao, Li Yao extended star to any Riemannian manifold. Um, well, here, here's, I should have written n plus one, right? By, because I'm in Rn plus one, to n, n plus one, if the Ricci curvature of G bar is greater or equal to zero. So Liao showed that this inequality is true, not just on Rn plus one, but on any Riemannian manifold of non-negative Ricci curvature. This is the famous Liao Hanak inequality. A 
okay? So this is the background from the linear heat equation. This is a completely linear heat equation that I just summarized uh, some important properties of the heat kernel of, and of positive solutions of the heat equation. Let's see how we can apply this to mean curvature flow. I have another 15 minutes, right? You want some discussion? Okay, I only take five. Okay. Now, suppose we have a solution of mean curvature flow. So suppose F mn cross zero t to nn plus one g bar solves mean curvature flow. And suppose we have such a u. Suppose u <coughs> from nn plus one g bar cross zero uh, t zero to r. Yeah, here we, t zero has to be less than t. <coughs> solves u positive, solves d dt u equals minus Laplace bar of u. Then, you see, this is on an n plus one dimensional flow, on an n plus one dimensional manifold, my heat kernel. My manifold is just n dimensional. So I cannot expect that the n plus one dimensional thing just perfectly works on the n dimensional thing. So I have to adjust. How do I adjust? Well, the heat kernel has this factor in front of it. And this is responsible for the scaling. It has an n plus one over two. If I want to be on an n-dimensional surface, I should just have n over two. So I rescale, important point here, cons now consider rho from mn cross zero t zero into r, where rho of <coughs> pt is defined as square root of 2t naught minus t to the one half. This is the rescaling that I just explained. And then I take the u at f of pt and t. So I take u restricted to my surface, but I rescale it in order to adjust the function to the fact that I'm on an n-dimensional surface and not on an n plus one dimensional space, okay? So I, this is the rescaled heat kernel on the ambient space. And now I want to compute its evolution equation. Right? So, so now compute DDT of rho. Now I get from the front, I get a uh, straightaway minus 2t naught minus t to the minus one half times u. And then I get from the full derivative plus 2t naught minus t to the one half times the ambient gradient of u uh, multiplied uh, with the speed of f, which is the mean curvature vector. This is the derivative with respect to the first entry here. And then I still get the um, derivative of u with respect to t. So I get t naught minus t to the one half times uh, the Laplacian in the ambient space of u. And now note that how do I can convert the uh, Laplacian in the ambient space to the Laplacian in the uh, uh, so hypersurface, well, the ambient Laplacian obviously takes all the derivatives in the hypersurface, but I'm missing one. This is the derivative in the uh, normal derivative, normal direction of u. 
And then, of course, these guys are sort of mixed up on the surface. They have to remind on the surface, so I get a term from the curving of the um, of in the hypersurface, and this is given by the mean curvature times the normal derivative in direction of nu times u. And <coughs> is this right? Um, I think I get a minus sign here. This is um, um, R plus u is uh, plus, yeah, plus, I think I got it, got the sign right. The sign is such that this term here is not canceling that term there, but adding it up. So you get DDT of rho is equal to, now the first term here just combines with this thing here to give me minus the Laplacian of rho, takes care of this term. Then the term there gives me um, minus two times the normal derivative of nu times h. This takes care of this and this guy. And then I have um, minus two t naught minus t uh, to the uh, minus one half times u. And then finally I got this guy here minus two t naught minus t to the one half times the normal derivative in the ambient space of u. Now, this guy here looks like the term in our Hanak inequality. If I take this in direction of the normal, you know, this is the ambient space. So if I take this in direction of the normal, then <coughs> I, uh, I get some information on this from this Harnack inequality. So let's express this. And then, because I'm here, this is a trivial calculation, just combine terms. And you can see, you can write it like this. I add in h squared rho. This is the adjoint heat equation on the hypersurface because the area element on the hypersurface moves like minus h squared. So the adjoint equation on the hypersurface to the Laplace to the heat equation is this one. So I add this in, then I have to subtract it off. And I subtract it off by <coughs> completing the square with this term. And you can write it like gradient bar in direction nu of log rho squared times rho, and what's left over is minus um, two times t naught minus t, and miraculously, these terms all combine to give you d bar nu, d bar nu minus d nu bar u squared over u plus uh, plus um, u over 2 t naught minus t uh, bracket closed. In other words, we get exactly the term, a term which we know is greater or equal to 0 if we are in Rn plus 1. So in Rn plus 1, this last bracket here is greater or equal to 0, and it vanishes completely on the uh, standard heat kernel. And that's the, thi that's the thi key theorem, this, this thing here. So let's summarize this as a theorem to conclude the lecture. So theorem, the function <coughs> uh, rho Times u is satisfies DDT rho less than minus La plus rho plus h squared rho <coughs> minus h plus gradient nu log rho 
squared times rho uh, minus 2 t naught minus t d bar nu d bar nu minus d nu u bar squared u uh, <coughs> plus u over 2 t naught minus t. So in, <coughs> in particular, in Rn plus 1, rho is a subsolution of the adjoint equation on MNT. <coughs> DDT rho is less than minus Laplace rho minus uh, plus h squared rho. And of course, we don't throw away this good term, right? So we get, in fact, um, DDT of rho is less than, is equal to, or no, it's less, less than to uh, minus Laplacian rho plus h squared rho uh, minus h plus gradient nu log rho squared rho. Better inequality. And as a corollary, you get the monotonicity formula. If you take ddt of the integral of rho, then the Laplacian integrates out to zero, h squared rho kills the evolution of d mu. We are only left with this term, and we get that this is less or equal than minus the integral of h plus gradient bar nu log rho uh, squared rho d mu, which is, of course, less or equal to zero. That's the monotonicity formula. And that's a good point to stop, so we have three minutes. Probably.